Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Common Sense with Dr. Ben Carson. I'm your host, Ben Carson. And, you know, we've all been a little bit concerned about the, the southern border, uh, maybe everybody except the administration, um, who says there's no problem there and that it's under control. But, uh, you know, we've seen increasing violence, over a million encounters already this fiscal year, and uh, increase in the number of people on the terrorist watch list. Uh, that's a little bit concerning. And I'm sure those terrorists aren't coming over here for a vacation. I think there's probably a reason that they're trying to get through here. And uh, last month, uh, Border Patrol uh, Chief Raul Ortez, uh, the guy who uh, came on subsequent to our guest today, he said that we do not have operational control of the border and uh, that the migration situation was at a crisis level. Now, Secretary Mayorkas will not use that word crisis. He will circumvent that in any way that he possibly can uh, because, you know, many people these days seem to think that if you just deny it, then it'll go away, sort of like the ostrich approach. But unfortunately, that's not going to be very effective for us. And uh, with Title 42 ending in May, uh, you know, what is the administration prepared to do? That's a real problem. And uh, we today are fortunate to have uh, Rodney Scott, who for three decades has been working in Border Patrol, culminating in his position as the 24th chief of the U.S. Border Patrol and uh, makes him very well qualified to talk about this. He's currently a senior fellow uh, of uh, border security for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. So welcome, Rodney, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for your tremendous service to our nation. Well, thank you, Dr. Kars, for having me on today. And uh and I give you the exact same thanks for your service and for continuing to uh, to stay engaged and try to make sure America just really knows what's going on. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, the, the number of encounters and crossings at the border in 2020 is quite a lot different than it is today. What, what has been the progression uh, that you've seen. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'll even back up a little bit farther than that, because this conversation so often uh, becomes a Trump administration versus a Biden administration, and it shuts off a lot of people in the middle. Um, I'll go back to my entire career. Uh, from 1994 mm -hmm. is when this country decided, hey, we really need to start doing something about border security. That was under Bill Clinton. And over my entire mm -hmm. career, up until January 21st, 2021, the border was getting more and more and more secure. Um, I will not uh, argue with anybody that when President Trump came in, he basically took it to a new level, uh, but he did it by talking to government, professional government employees, people that have been doing this for years, uh, took our advice and really just kind of put on steroids the strategy that the Border Patrol uh, and ICE already had in place. And really mm -hmm. that was, you know, some of the infrastructure on the border, you heard about the border wall and everything else. But it was also policies in place that just really made sure that we adhered to the rule of law and that we didn't allow people into the country that weren't supposed to be into the country without due process. Uh, the current and, and uh, honestly, that slowed down the flow to a dramatically low level. COVID, obviously, Title 42 helped some, but people focus on that way too much. You need to look at how the trends were dropping dramatically before COVID hit. And something else that gets left out of the conversation is as the illegal alien crossings on the southwest border decreased, that takes away a distraction the cartel uses to shape the border. What that also means mm -hmm. is that gives Border Patrol agents more time to go out and actually patrol the border. So if you look at statistics, not only were the illegal alien apprehensions dropping, drug seizures and other criminal arrests were actually increasing because agents could go out and do their job and they weren't overwhelmed with this, this civil immigration processing. Unfortunately, as you know, the Biden administration reversed all of that and the border is less secure today than it was when I started in 94. Well, what, uh, what 
rationale do they give for, for their policy? Have they offered any rationale for it? You know what? You don't really, not really a rationale per se, but it's kind of, you just have to listen to what they say. So this administration campaigned basically on an open border. They said they wanted safer uh, processes where people could come into the United States in ways that they didn't have to use the cartel or they, they didn't have to come in illegally. Well, that sounds all good, but we have this thing called the Immigration and Naturalization Act. It's federally enacted laws of the United States that say who and what uh, can enter our home. And I just fundamentally, I, I spent seven months in the Biden administration. They don't like it. They don't agree with it. And many people in the administration think we should have open borders and we should allow anybody that wants to come to come in. Um, and it just seems like all their strategies are focused on that. Uh, even the current programs, the latest programs they've ruled out, they push all the money and all the focus on expediting the processing of individuals. Um, they've really reduced detention space and they've really walked away from any type of enforcement. Yeah. Well, how is it possible to have a nation uh, if you don't have enforceable borders? That's a great question. And uh, I, I use kind of an analogy. Some people like it, some don't. Um, but a lot of people have a hard time kind of grasping this border security concept. And I just remind people that it's exactly like your personal home. Simply, if you can't control who and what enters your home, you have no security. You can't provide your family any security. And around the world, we have basic concepts. When someone comes to your home, you expect them to come to the front door, knock, present themselves, and then you get to make a rational decision who and what you allow into your home. At a national level, we set up border security on the same principles. We have over 328 legal front doors. We call them ports of entry. And the laws are set up that people are supposed to come and go through those ports of entry. And just like your home, anybody trying to sneak into your home other than the front door or through force, it's not going to be accepted. And we should not accept that as a nation either. And that's Border Patrol's job, really overly simplified, of course, but is to make sure people use the front door and people aren't trying to sneak in or bring things into the country uh, in between those front doors. Unfortunately, this administration took away all the consequences. Um, and the tools that we were using to encourage people to come through the front door and come legally. And they've actually, through what this catch and release policies that they currently have in place, they've really pretty much encouraged people that if you don't want to wait in line, don't. Just come in between the ports of entry. We'll process you much quicker than if you waited in the legal line. And uh, in many, many cases, just release you into the U.S. to wait for your court date uh, years down the road. Yeah. That is not a winning model. Well, what you've said uh, is way too uh, logical. It makes too much sense. So obviously that's why it's not being adopted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, interestingly, you know, the, the journey uh, that many of the people make from South and Central America and, and other parts of the world can sometimes be pretty dangerous. Uh, I've heard about the tent cities. What, what are the conditions in those places? Yeah, the journey uh, can be horrific. People don't really understand, I think, a lot of times when they get involved, uh, they, they basically buy into the lies uh, that the cartel is there to help them and they're just going to facilitate them into the U.S. But whether it's down like in Panama and the Darien Gap areas or once you get into Mexico, these people are really putting their, hand, their, their lives and their families' lives in the hands of people that only care about money. There's, there's no human humanitarian thoughts that go into these people whatsoever. Um, and whether it's the, the, the camps along the way where it's just, it can be, you know, 10 or 20 people, up to hundreds of people uh, crammed into these small areas, whether they be train cars or, or, or houses. The sanitation is usually uh, quite horrific, to be honest, all the way up uh, to and through the southwest border. Where again, I, th I don't think people really understand the cartels. Yes, they actually help people. They smuggle people across the border. They make a billions of dollars off of it. But that's not, from my pro professional experience, that's not really their objective. Their objective is to make sure that they can have a flow of human beings that they can continually use as shields. What I mean by that is they'll bring the illegal aliens up to the border. They've already watched. They know how many Border Patrol agents are on duty, how many Texas Higher Patrol. They know everything going on. And they get enough illegal aliens to push across the border to overwhelm all those resources so that they can bring in the second wave without any interference by law enforcement. And what is in that second wave? That's the narcotics. That's the terrorists. That's the criminals. That's anybody that's willing to pay extra money. So the cartel sees these people as just commodities, if you will. 
And as soon as a, a individual slows down or has any kind of additional burden on the cartel, they'll just abandon them. We've seen them abandon children in the desert. We've seen them abandon people in the middle of the Rio Grande River that, that are drowning. Um, we've seen them abandon people in, in Mexico. They take them out to very, very remote areas. Um, and then the abuse and the human trafficking uh, is, is really, I believe, off the charts, very hard to measure because many of these people don't realize yet they're being trafficked. They think that these organizations are just smuggling them. And there is a difference. Human trafficking is like sex slavery, labor slavery, you know, modern day slavery. That was my next question for you. Having these lax rules at the border, what has been the impact on trafficking? So I think it's going to be years before we know. But here's what we do know now. Just sheer numbers have gone through the roof. Hundreds of thousands of unaccompanied children being left in the hands of the cartels being brought across the border. Almost 3 million human beings last year that Border Patrol encountered. But that number is misleading because Border Patrol documented over six, or almost 600,000 what we call gotaways, where they saw people crossing, but they were literally out of, out of Border Patrol agents to respond. Every case over my entire career of human trafficking that the Border Patrol discovered, it was through good debriefs of individuals that we arrested. An observant agent would see a child just not behaving right, didn't really feel comfortable with the adult that they were with or didn't look like it was a normal you know, parent-child relationship. So they would separate them. They would ask some questions. They would start tearing apart the stories because they've always got a cover story. They would find cracks mm -hmm. in that story. Today, none of that's happening because agents simply don't have the time. They're dealing with, with over 5,000 encounters every single day. They're still processing right now today people they caught yesterday. They don't have any time to do those deep dive interviews to be able to, to tell whether somebody is actually related or not. And that situation is just right for human trafficking. And you, anybody would be naive to think that it wasn't just going uh, off the charts undetected currently. What does a humane immigration system look like? I think a humane immigration or humane laws in general are fair laws and you actually enforce the law and you prevent, not just respond to, but you try to set up structures that prevent people from putting themselves or others into life-threatening or very, very dangerous situations. So I, I, I'm glad you brought that up because this administration campaigned on a quote-unquote more humane border and they say their policies are more mm -hmm. humane. So let's look at how that's played out. Again, under the Trump administration, cross-border illegal activity, uh, illegal aliens dropped tremendously simply by enforcing the rule of law through the migrant protection protocols. So this administration, you know, they, they kind of lie about that as well. So that, that's mm -hmm. the Remain in Mexico program. And all that program did was say, if you come to the U.S. and cross that Southwest border, and you're going to try to make an asylum claim we want to make sure that a judge hears your claim and you get a day in court. But we're just not going to release you into the United States to wander around freely for six to eight years in the meantime. You just have to wait in Mexico until your court date. And then we even provided transportation from the border uh, to the court and then, and then back across mm -hmm. the border. The minute we did that, over 80 percent of the fraudulent claims just went away because people knew they couldn't beat the system and get released into the United States. So what does is, what is all that result in? Uh, lowered illegal immigration, lowered deaths along the southwest border, increased narcotics seizures, increased enforcement activity where we were taking pedophiles and murderers off the streets of America and making everybody more safe. Since January 2021, we've seen unprecedented illegal activity across the border. Uh, there, the deaths, border-related deaths that we actually know about have skyrocketed. Just in recent news, you saw the, uh, the 40 people that died in, in the uh, detention facility in Mexico, the 56 in a trailer in San Antonio. There were two different events where people were locked in train cars. And then I, I interact with the state of Texas quite often. I was talking to uh, one of their leaders, one of their commanders recently, said they're having 30 to 40 high-speed vehicle pursuits a day, a day. So it's not even just the migrants that are, that are being threatened now. It's actually everybody that lives in those communities. And these people are being lied to. They're putting their lives in the hands of these smugglers. And then in many cases, their asylum claims are not going, they're not going to meet the, the definition of political asylum. So they're being lied to. So wh which is a more humane process where people know in advance 
that, hey, here's the standards and, and we can help people in their home countries. That, By the way, that's something the Trump administration really never gets any credit for. A big part of our program of border security is working with Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador, right. and Mexico to improve mm-hmm. their systems as well. So people didn't feel like they had to come up here, but, exactly. but that doesn't get any attention. Um, I believe that the border chaos today, think of anything in chaos, is killing people. And it's killing a lot more than a safe and secure border would do. And all we have to do is look back a few years. You can even go before the Trump administration, look at San Diego, for example, back in the 90s, completely out of control, shootings, rapes, robberies every night. Once we established law and order there, and it was kind of the proof of concept, if you will, all of a sudden, even life in Tijuana got better. People started investing in properties and businesses along the border, and it became an economic boom for both Tijuana and San Diego that could have never existed with the chaos that was there before. So there's also a monetary uh, aspect that uh, that we're really losing out today on because because chaos kills people and chaos pushes people away. It it doesn't bring in the type of activity and people that that you want in a community. Well, with this problem, as with so many problems that we face today, There are logical solutions. It seems like uh, no one's really interested in the data and the facts and the things that have worked. They just want to push ideology. And uh, it's in the process of really hurting this nation very badly. I've heard it said, and I don't know if it's true or not, that a, a lot of other countries are releasing some of their worse criminals and letting them come across our border into our country. Uh, that would be really horrible. But is that true? Yeah, I, unfortunately, I do believe that's true. We saw something similar years and years ago with Cuba. Uh, but as of late, uh, Venezuela seems to be the, uh, the culprit. And think about it from their perspective. What a great model, right? You basically get to let out people that are creating problems for you and your communities. Uh, and in many cases, it might be people that fight back against uh, that corrupt socialistic government that, that's taken over down there. Um, and you just aim them north to be somebody else's problem. Um, w- once again, it, there's so many layers to this that it, with a secure border, I really believe we would be helping the Venezuelans that are staying behind by, by making sure that they had people there, especially the ones that are trying to fight back against the government, uh, t- to build those coalitions. Yeah. Well, you know, some of the people... Uh, say that they they parse over whether fentanyl is coming through ports of entry <laughs> or between ports of entry. Does it really matter? <laughs> so so uh, yes and no. I, no, it doesn't matter, but that's a lie. So, I, well, let me, that's a strong word. That's a, a mistruth, if you will. I've heard the same thing. I heard the secretary say it. So you could remake, state that in a different way and make it true statement. So here's the facts. We seize more fentanyl coming through our ports of entry currently than anywhere else. That's, what, that's where we see it. Well, why is that? Well, the ports of entry have technology, but they also have a Customs and Border Protection officer anytime they're open, standing ready to greet you and inspect you and your uh, belongings. We also have a lot of advanced information for some of, the tra- some of the commercial trucks and everything else, and we just have a better opportunity. But how, back to common sense, how can you say that's where all the fentanyl is crossing when you know, and the secretary knows this, and he knew it when he he made the statement, you know that hundreds and hundreds of miles of border are being left open every single day, and they're being left open in a very controlled manner by the cartel because they're pushing across these large groups of migrants, they're overwhelming law enforcement, and then you're, we're seeing trucks or other people come through totally camoed up trying to get away. Um, we know we've caught fentanyl in those situations before. We've caught every drug there is really in between the ports of entry. And we haven't even really talked about our coasts lately. So when I was the chief patrol agent out in San Diego, the maritime threat was, was increasing dramatically. We had boats landing uh, in San Diego all the time. Uh, but as far north as, is basically uh, almost San Francisco, just, just south of San Francisco. Um, we're not monitoring any of that now because all the border patrol agents are overwhelmed. So yes, we're seizing more there, but really we don't know where it's entering. So this is what we should be focused on, is what we're doing at the border affecting the the supply in Chicago? Is it affecting the supply in Minneapolis? Is it affecting the the cost of narcotics on the street, simple supply and demand? 
And I believe that uh, everybody would agree fentanyl and just about every other drug you would want are readily available pretty much anywhere in the United States. And, and let me add my other plug. That's my other misnomer. This is not a border problem. This is a national security problem. Nothing stays at the border. That's just a line in the sand, if you will. It's a transit area that, that people are trying to get through, whether it be commodities or, or people. But they're going to every one of your, your viewers, towns, cities, states, and it affects every American, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. And the, uh, the products, the precursors, are supplied by China in large part. And then they're sent to Mexico, where you have labs that are not controlled in any way. Uh, they can give you quality product or very dangerous product, uh, very potent product. And a lot of times people are deceived and they take something that they think is relatively mild and they end up dead. Yeah, correct. So th this is a, a big conspiracy uh, where China, they know as well, they're systematically shipping the precursors in exactly how you stated. And then the, another big problem is in those labs in Mexico, there's a couple of things. One, they make fentanyl, but they also make these fake pills. So the, the fentanyl that comes into the U.S. in pill form or is even pressed in, into pill form once it's in the United States, it doesn't say fentanyl on it. It's usually a, a fake pill, like it says it's OxyContin or it's some other prescription pill, and it's made to look exactly like it, but it's laced mm -hmm. with fentanyl. And that's another reason I refer to fentanyl deaths as poisonings and not overdoses, because many times the people that die don't know they're ingesting fentanyl. They did not do it intentionally. Um, but this is a huge threat to the United States. More people have died from opioid fentanyl overdoses than in our wars, than in 9-11, uh, than, than uh, almost 100,000 people last year. I think 70,000 were, were related to fentanyl. Unbelievable. Well... Let me just change directions just slightly here. Um, there was a lot of controversy during the last administration about building a wall. Are walls effective? Uh, look at the White House. Look at uh, pretty much any, any controlled environment you've gone to down to a sporting event. Creating barriers and funnel points is a basic part of almost any security plan, and it's not controversial in any setting really other than border security. But then let me tell you from my experience why border, why the border wall system. And it was a system, by the way. I call it a smart wall, uh, but it's a border wall system, why it was so important. The United States Border Patrol started installing barriers on the border early, early in my career. Um, and San Diego, again, was, was the test case where we kind of proved out this border wall system, if you will. We could not. We, we detailed thousands of people into San Diego, Border Patrol agents, and we could not control the border without that barrier. Once we installed that barrier and the, and the wall system, which includes technology access and some lighting, and the technology has evolved, obviously, not only were we able to establish law and order in that area and reduce illegal crossings by over 95%, we also were able to pull 150 agents out of that area every 24 hours and then reassign them somewhere else, whether it be the coast or, or another area. So that was a 28, I'm sorry, that was only a 12 mile section, by the way. It wasn't all of San Diego sector. That was only 12 miles. That was a $28 million return on the investment for the taxpayer every single year for the life in salaries and benefits alone for the life cycle of that wall system. So these are the types of things that, that I personally, when I briefed President Trump out in San Diego during the proto, bro, uh, border wall prototype uh, tour, if you will, these are the things that we explained to them and the entire administration why we needed it so much. How many border patrol agents would it take to patrol the border, just the southwest border, we forget about the coast and the northern border, without any way of slowing down the people that cross or without any queuing? It would almost bankrupt this country. But when you build that barrier, it makes every single agent more effective because they can cover significantly more area by themselves and it really restricts the cartel's ability to do that cat and mouse game I was telling you about before. Push a large group across to your left and then run another uh, group of narcotics or, or aliens to your right. It's very, very important. And, and I got to touch on this too. It wasn't just a barrier. It had technology built into it that allowed us to know when anybody got anywhere near that barrier. And it was getting more and more progressive where it also cued us if it wasn't a threat. We could tell if it was an animal or whatever. So it's, it helped us to not respond if we didn't have to. 
But the Biden administration mm -hmm. shut that off before most of the technology was turned on. So even though we had about 450 miles of new border wall system put in place under the Trump administration, that technology piece that was supposed to go with it, there's only about 60 miles of that in the board, in the in the ground that I know of along the southwest border. It would have dramatic. It, it makes every agent safer. And it was a great investment of tax dollars. The, the return on investment was there every single day and just salaries and benefits alone. Right. Well, before we take another break, uh, let me just ask you, I'm sure you've had a chance to talk to a number of people who are trying to become U.S. citizens legally. Uh, how do they feel about this situation? Unbelievably frustrated. I actually do have friends. I had a friend that was waiting for years out in San Diego and finally did get uh, through the naturalization process. But this chaos is backing up the court system with fraudulent cases. So people, I actually know of a recent case as a, as a secondary friend uh, from Russia that was directly threatened by the current administration and was basically told to leave the country and was trying to go through the, the legal systems here and literally couldn't get any attention because our system is completely overwhelmed with these fraudulent cases. Again, the chaos prevents us from helping people that really need to be helped. And it's really putting our, the immigration system that we're proud of in this country at risk of being completely destroyed. If you wanna protect people that really need to be protected from political uh, uh, persecution, and you wanna protect our proud immigration history, you've gotta have controls in place that keep integrity in our immigration system. And they're very frustrated because they're not seeing it. And they almost feel like they should jump in, you know, out of line and cross the border illegally, too. But luckily, their integrity is intact and they're not doing that. Yeah, I've heard people say that about Djokovic, the tennis player. Yeah. He should just come back here and go through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's so ridiculous. This, this administration is really encouraging people to violate the law and to abuse the system. And they know it. I've had conversations with many of them and they just they don't care. We have data. Uh, on all of this stuff. And it's so easy to apply logic and common sense to solve the problem if they actually want it to solve the problem. But this is where the people come in. The people have got to be smart enough to recognize when you have policies and officials that are not working in your interest and uh, are being driven by ideology and not by what's good for the people. You've got to be able to realize it because if you don't, uh, you're going to lose your freedoms. You're going to lose everything. I, I couldn't agree more. I, another thing that really I'm kind of afraid of in today's society is just the way that this is reported on in the media and, and other caveats. It's getting harder and harder to tell what the truth is. So I encourage everybody to do some of your own research but I've also been pushing for transparency legislation for different organizations because right now it really is hard to find true, just just pure data on the immigration process. Is it working or, or isn't it that's not been filtered through a think tank or a nonprofit? I'm very proud that when I was chief of the Border Patrol and Mark Morgan was commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, we pushed more information onto the CBP's public website than ever in history. Uh, and really set some stuff in motion there. So I encourage people to look at cbp.gov and look at some of the numbers. You can drill down into criminals, terrorists. There's a whole bunch of different spreadsheets on there. It's not super user-friendly, but it's just pure data. And I think people will come away from that with their eyes wide open versus what they're, what they're hearing and seeing Absolutely. in the media. Now, uh, Rodney, you've had a long career in, in border control. Border Patrol, including before the attacks on our country on September 11. One of the recommendations of the 9-11 Commission was that we should know who's in the country. And yet, you know, this situation on the southern border precludes that. Uh, how does that impact our national security? Directly. I'm very, very afraid that people are already, terrorists are actually in this country just waiting for the go signal at a level that we've never really seen before. Um, just for example, wh when I retired from being chief, uh, shortly thereafter, I pinned a letter to the oversight committees with the Senate and the House, and I highlighted that known or suspected uh, terrorists and, and associates, people on the national terrorist watch list, 
crossing the southwest border was on the rise dramatically. And that's when there were only 12. But it was early into the year and we'd already had 12. And in my entire experience in the Border Patrol, my career, the most we'd ever had in a single fiscal year was six. So I highlighted it as 12. Last year, we arrested 98. But think about this. If you thought that the United States had any type of a record on you whatsoever, uh, would you willingly walk up to a Border Patrol agent and surrender or allow yourself to get caught? People forget there were 600,000 incidences where people were, dot, were seen crossing the border illegally and they got away. Those are the ones I'm really, really worried about above and beyond that 98. Statistically, if we encountered 98, I, I couldn't even imagine what was in, which is in the gotaways and, and kind of how we started this. If you can't control who and what enters your home, any conversation about who gets to stay is irrelevant. Talking about like DACA, immigration reform or whatever, we've got to have things in place that allow us to know who and what enters our home. And we proved over several administrations that we could do it. The border was getting more and more secure. If you remember 9-11, all your, all your viewers, the threat then came through the ports of entry. All, those, all the terrorists were overstays. They, they entered the country legally in some way, shape, or form. So we focused on that hot and heavy for several years, making sure that the ports of entry had information at a level they had never had before, that we were communicating with all the three-letter agencies. While we still worked in between the ports of entry, but we prioritized the ports of entry. That's another reason so much stuff is going in between the ports today is because we, we knew it was going to happen, but we had a plan to also address in between. Unfortunately, the Biden administration shut that part of it down. And, and we, this is a national security threat. This is not simply you know, immigrants or, or immigration. And again, what I don't know, I'll just use the word frustrated. What frustrates me the most is people like Secretary Mayorkas that have been around long enough. He was in DHS before the Obama administration and, and even my first interactions with him uh, when he became secretary. He made it very, very clear that he knows and understands the implications of the policy decisions they're making, and they still do it. Mm. It's, it's really very disturbing. You know, over 150 different nationalities have been encountered crossing the border. And uh, with all the other things going on, the, the economy uh, having severe problems, particularly because of our energy policies, the Russia and China alliance, uh, and, and they're draining our financial coffers uh, through the war in Ukraine and decreasing our preparedness for war. We have uh, the indoctrination of our children with all kinds of strange things. Uh, the hatred, the crime, and now all these people coming across the border. Is this sustainable? Oh, no. No way, shape, or form is it sustainable for many reasons. One, the terrorist threat we talked about. Two, I won't get into it too much here, but there are nation-state threats that are also exploiting uh, these vulnerabilities on the southwest border. And then I'm glad you touched on the 150 different nationalities. The first phase of that is it's, we don't have any, any knowledge of these people. They can tell the border patrol agent pretty much whatever they want. There's no global database to be able to vet who they are. So you have that aspect. But think about all the different languages they speak. So that's another reason it slows down the border patrol process. But any of these, these people are going to your communities. And again, no matter, I mean, I'm, I'm compassionate. I grew up Christian. I want to help people. However, there's second layer effects. We're having huge problems in our schools today with just basically keeping kids at the appropriate grade level. And now you're going to infuse literally millions of children potentially that don't speak English and or Spanish. They're speaking all these different languages. If you don't think that's going to directly take away from the time that a teacher has to spend with all the children that should be here, you're kind of fooling yourself. And then most of these people, unfortunately, end up in the, the already underserved communities across the United States. So they're going to be using the local ERs as their primary doctor, their primary health care. And our systems are just not set up for this. Um, look at Martha's Vineyard or look at New York. They got a very small fraction of the illegal aliens that are crossing through Texas. And they freaked out and said that they couldn't they couldn't handle it and wanted to declare a national emergency, bring in the National Guard. No, this is not sustainable. And I think with an open, transparent dialogue, Everybody would realize that it's not. Unfortunately, this administration, I 
hides information. I believe that it base they they lie by giving little pieces of information, but not telling the whole story. Um, but no, to answer your question, this is in no way, shape, or form sustainable. Well, you know, speaking of children, you know, you, you look at some of these children who are being brought here or sent here uh, from elsewhere. The, a New York Times uh, journalist said there are 12-year-old roofers and slaughterhouse workers and other factory workers, late night shift workers. Uh, all of this is really a part of letting all these people in. They're ending up in some horrendous situations, not just the trafficking for sexual purposes, but true abuse of people's rights. And then this administration likes to say that it's more humane. I don't see it in any way, shape, or form how this chaos and all the damage that it creates to individual human beings, regardless of what country they came from, and to the, the safety of this entire nation, how you can tell people with a straight face it's more humane. It's not. There's not a statistic out there that supports this. Um, and I am really worried about those, those children. Uh, those that don't know, when an illegal alien crosses the border, especially a child by himself, um, that does not go to your state CPS. Under federal law, that child has to go to Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement. And if you looked at an organizational chart of Health and Human Services, that is, as you know, that is like the most underfunded, small little division within that, that department. So they contract out okay. their work. And they're putting kids with, quote unquote, sponsors while they wait for their immigration hearing without vetting that you would think was the very basic level of, of vetting and follow up at, say, a child protective services of a state level. Um, that, that whole situation is very, very ripe for, for abuse and trafficking as well. But uh, it's very hard to watch. Um, there's a, a solution, according to this administration. Um, it's called the CBP-1 app. <laughs> <laughs> what can you tell us about that? How is that a solution? So that, again, is smoke and mirrors. So back to my home analogy, and they're kind of trying to use that. They're saying, hey, come to our front door. We'll set you up an appointment to enter illegally. Um, you just have to wait in line. And then once you apply through this app, uh, we'll give you your day in court. If you don't apply for the app, supposedly there'll be these consequences. But those consequences, first and foremost, don't really exist. But then they leave a few things out. First off, to use that app, you have to be up close to the border. So it's kind of an enticement. It's a pull factor anyway. It gets people up close to the border. Once those people have left their homes... And they get on, and you can see a lot of this open source media now reporting on it as well. And then they try to get onto the app, and it tells them they have an appointment months down the road, or they have problems with the app. The throughput does not exist within CBP because, by the way, those CBP officers are the same ones that are supposed to be emptying cargo containers and looking for fentanyl. They're the ones that are bringing in anything that's imported externally, your entire supply chain. So it's taking people away from that. You can't take everybody off of that, so the throughput doesn't exist. Um, I think you saw in El Paso this last weekend a bunch of Venezuelan and Cubans that, sh that are subject to that program said enough is enough and crossed the border in droves because they're not going to wait. Mm -hmm. it, it's a joke. This administration throws out a, a little bit of smoke, look over here, kind of like the cartel does, but their real play, by the way, at the same time, uh, they were reducing detention space once again in, uh, in next year's budget so they can claim that they can't detain people. Um, it's, it's, it's a joke. Uh, we've had the epitome of common sense today with uh, former Border Patrol Chief Rodney Scott talking about what's going on at the border. You know, there are those who are saying, there's no problem at the border. Everything is fine. We have it under control. Meanwhile, millions of people are coming across. If I was Iran, who hates America, I would be sending my operatives to there, and I would be targeting those critical 13 substations in the electric grid. I mean, there's a whole bunch of stuff I would be doing. And you know what? <laughs> they probably are doing that. And we better continue to pray that God will protect us until we get somebody or, or some leaders who kind of understand what's going on and will respond appropriately. But uh, Rodney, just uh, as a parting shot, uh, 
you know, you've been at this for a long time. Uh, bang, bang, bang. What, what do we need to do to secure our border? Yeah, I like how you keyed this up because that's all true and it's not overly complicated. Border Patrol had a strategy in place, but basically that strategy requires there to be consequences. So the first thing you have to do right now before even border wall or anything else is end catch and release. This administration makes it sound inhumane, but it's not. All ending catch and release means is there are multiple options. You can either detain someone until a judge hears their case or make them stay outside the United States until a judge hears their case. The minute people know that they're not going to get released into the U.S. until the judge hears their case, most of them go home. And then that allows us to get to the ones that really need it. The second thing we need to do is we need to turn back on that border walls, that smart border walls uh, construction that was making every single agent out in the field more effective. And then we don't talk about it much, but another piece of that was some fiber optics and some communication technology that was going in that allowed every agent on a smartphone to see everything going on around them and again, work together smarter. Um, but those two big things, end catch and release, and then make sure that the agents get the infrastructure and the capabilities they need, those are the biggest two bullets. And you know what's ironic? In the last administration, as we got those in place and we were seeing dramatic improvements in the border, more and more people were actually willing on the right uh, to talk about different types of, of immigration law reform. Okay, now that we got, now that we can control who and what comes in, let's talk about who should or shouldn't. All that conversation went away. We could get that back if you just ended catch and release and basically re-implemented the infrastructure that, we, by the way, you already paid for. We're just not doing right. it. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for not only being our guest today, but for your 30 years of service and your continued contributions. You're a true patriot, and we really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words, and thank you for staying in the fight. You didn't have to stay either. <laughs> okay. And we'll be back with my closing thoughts in one minute. Well, I want to thank uh, Rodney Scott for joining our podcast this time. What an incredible fellow. So much experience and wisdom and common sense solutions to how we solve the border problem. Why are we not using our brains? Why are we just using ideology, which is leading us into the wrong places? Lord help us. But anyway, what I'd like you to do now, we're approaching a one year from starting uh, our Common Sense podcast. I'd like to hear from you. What do you think of the podcast? Uh, how do you think it can be improved? What are some of the topics you'd like to hear about? Let me know, ben at americancornerstone.org. And we may use your ideals on the show. Remember to subscribe for free, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss any episodes. You can go back and review all the old episodes. There's a lot of good stuff there with uh, tremendous people. And remember to rate and review us. Tell your friends, your family, everybody about us, because we have got to spread common sense in our country. And remember the cornerstones that made America great. Faith, liberty, community, and life. See you next week.